Hello everyone and welcome. Perhaps you have driven or perhaps you've purchased the vehicle with a small turbocharged engine and it claimed, you know, it's going to have the power of a V6 and yet the fuel economy of a small four cylinder. And then you're actually driving it around and you're noticing your numbers don't quite match up with the numbers you saw on the sticker saying you're going to get this kind of fuel economy in this car. So in this video, we're going to be talking about why small turbocharged engines may not always get the great fuel economy that they claim to. And so we're going to talk about some of the benefits. There are legitimate legitimate reasons why you might want to have a downsized turbocharged engine, but then we're going to get into why you may not actually see in the real world those kind of fuel economy numbers that the manufacturers are claiming it will get. And so starting off with the benefits, why might you downsize an engine and throw a turbocharger on it? Well, the benefits are very real. The engine's smaller, it weighs less, it's got less moving parts, you've got less friction, you've got less pumping losses. And so depending on the loading scenario on that engine, how you're driving it, you can actually get really good fuel economy with these small turbocharged engines. But then you start asking for power and things change up a bit. And so looking at an engine here, and I've got plenty of videos talking about how turbochargers work, but a very simple representation here. We've got our engine, we've got the turbocharger, this thing spools up with the exhaust gases and it pulls in additional air. So let's say, you know, we have atmospheric pressure within this engine. That's about 14.7 or about 15 PSI. And using this turbocharger, this compressor right here, we're able to add in seven and a half PSI of additional boost. So now we've got about 50% more oxygen within this engine and as a result we inject more fuel and as a result of having more air and more fuel burning we get you know somewhere around 50% more power. So the idea behind a turbocharger is very clever. It allows you to have small displacement engines that still get a lot of power. But it may come down to being power or efficiency, not necessarily, you know, both at the same time, even though there are ways to indeed have both at the same time, which we'll get into later. Now, the problem with turbocharged engines is knock. And so one of the things manufacturers have to design for is how do we eliminate knock? So what is knock? Well, as that piston's compressing that air and fuel mixture on its way up towards the top of the cylinder, you have your spark plug fire, and it of course ignites the air fuel mixture. But the temperature and the pressure, because it's turbocharged, is very high. And so you may have pockets where that air fuel mixture is hot enough that it ignites on its own. And then as a result, you have two ignition sources, you have these colliding flame fronts, and you know, worst case, you can have quite severe damage if you have really bad engine knock. And so a turbocharged engine, it's adding in air, it's adding in fuel, and as a result, you're having higher cylinder pressures. So each individual cylinder has higher pressures, and as a result, each individual cylinder has higher temperatures. And all of this gives you a greater likelihood to have knock. Okay, so what things can the manufacturers do in order to eliminate knock so that you can still have high boost levels, high power, and not have this knock destroying your engine? Well, you can use, uh, you can retard the ignition timing, but that means you're not gonna be as efficient, you're not gonna make as much power, so you don't wanna do that. You can lower the compression ratio, which also means uh, less power overall and lower efficiency, but you will often notice that turbocharged engines use uh, significantly lower compression ratios than other style engines, and that's to help uh, reduce the likelihood of having knock and that in itself makes the engine less efficient. But the real kicker here and the real reason why you may not see great fuel economy using your downsized turbocharged engine has to do with the air fuel mixture at these higher loads. So what happens is as you floor it in that small turbocharged engine, it wants to avoid these high temperature scenarios in each cylinder. And one of the ways it does that is by using a really rich air fuel mixture. So ideally you're running somewhere around 14.7 to one air to fuel ratio. That's the ideal amount where you're gonna burn all the oxygen, you're gonna burn all the fuel, it's gonna work out great but when you're running at high boost levels and high throttle you're going to lower that from 14.7 to perhaps 11 to 1 uh, perhaps 12 to 1 uh, in order to bring the temperature in that cylinder down uh, and so that might seem strange that injecting more fuel actually brings the temperature down but it does part of the reason why is as you inject that fuel and it has the phase change from a liquid to a gas it drops the temperature within there so you're injecting more fuel purely to lower the temperature within that cylinder and as a result of doing this, uh, you're able to avoid knock and create lots of power. Of course, the downside is by having that rich air fuel mixture, you're not creating power very efficiently. And so if you were to look at a graph of torque here on uh, the vertical axis and then RPM on the horizontal axis, 
and you look at the torque curve of a turbocharged engine. So it'll start somewhat low, come up as that turbo builds boost, and then taper off as it starts to get, you know, too much uh, speed for that uh, turbocharger. And so you look at, you know, this is what your, your peak torque is, what the engine is totally capable of. And then if you were to look at, you know, how much torque can you create? How much torque can you ask for? How much throttle can you ask for from that engine before it has to start enriching that air fuel mixture in order to avoid knock? And it's generally not going to be very much. So that's this line right here. So you can see that, you know, without applying too much throttle, you're going to get past this point where you can still use an ideal air fuel ratio and still make efficient power. Then you're going to go beyond that. And once you're beyond that, you're using that rich air fuel mixture. And as a result, you're getting lots of power. Great, but you're not doing it very efficiently. And so with a naturally aspirated engine, let's say a larger naturally aspirated engine, which has its drawbacks, you don't want that many cylinders, uh, you don't want that size necessarily for the low load scenarios, uh, but as you add those cylinders, the amount of work that each cylinder is doing is less. The amount of air and fuel going into one cylinder is less. So those cylinder pressures are lower, the temperatures are lower, and as a result, you don't have to use as rich of air fuel mixtures. And so by using a less rich air fuel mixture in these high torque scenarios in a naturally aspirated engine, you're able to get a better, uh, you're able to get more power for the amount of fuel that you're injecting into it. So, you know, the benefit of these small turbo engines at low loads, you can get good fuel economy, but then once you start asking for those higher amounts of power in order for it to avoid knock, it has to use a really rich mixture. And so you get poor fuel economy. Now, why do this? Uh, why go this strategy? Well, from the manufacturer's end, if they're looking to publish, you know, EPA city and highway numbers, and that cycle doesn't have much demand, if the demand is all on this low end, well, then you can use a small turbo engine to kind of trick that test into showing great fuel economy numbers. Whereas if you were to start getting into those higher load scenarios, those fuel economy numbers are going to go down. And so, you know, that's kind of an interesting thing where it's a manufacturer choice of how accurate do they want their EPA published numbers to represent the fuel economy that you're actually going to get. And so the next video that I make, and I'll include a link to it uh, somewhere around here once it's actually published, but the next video I make is going to be on Mazda's 2.5 liter turbo. And we're gonna be talking about how they actually design in order to raise this level right here at which you can have increased loads and still be within that stoichiometric air fuel ratio and still get a good amount of power without sacrificing your fuel economy nearly as much as some other styles of small turbos. So look forward to that video. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, of course, feel free to leave those below. Thanks for watching.